All righty, we are right at seven o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and go through some announcements real quick. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Zach Holmes. Um, I'm a board member uh, with uh, Alachua Audubon Society and I'm in charge of our evening program series. Uh, this is our first evening program of the year. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, as always, if you ever have any suggestions about evening program topics, titles, or interests, uh, please feel free to email me um, and let me know. So I'm going to go through a few announcements on the Alachua Audubon Society side, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our talk. So um, thanks again for joining us. Our next evening program is going to be on December 8th. Uh, and that'll be uh, Ernesto Reyes, who's going to talk to us about uh, birding and traveling through Cuba. Uh, and then the one after that is going to be on January uh, 23rd of, in the new year. And that presentation is by Chris Benish, who's going to talk to us all about flycatcher ecology um, of some of those flycatchers that we see from out west that come here from time to time. So some cool presentations coming up as well. Also, this is about to begin Christmas bird count season. If you're not familiar with what that is, um, uh, Christmas bird counts are a traditional um, birding day uh, that happens on the, roughly the same time every year. And uh, a bunch of birders get together to try to see as many species as possible within our count circles. And it's really helps as a citizen science project. So we have several Christmas bird counts coming up. Uh, the Gainesville Christmas bird count is on December 17th. Um, but there's four other Christmas bird counts in the region. So if you have your pins ready, I'll go through these slowly. We have the Melrose Christmas bird count on December 15th, the Itchitutney Springs Christmas bird count on the 19th of December, the Lake City Christmas bird count on December 27th, and the Cedar Key Christmas bird count on January 4th. I'll go ahead and pop all those into the, the comments as well, just so you can you can get those down um, if, you, if you're interested in joining us or have any other questions. Um, lastly, the Alachua Audubon Society holiday uh, social is happening on December 1st. We hope to see you there. It's our first um, holiday social since COVID. Um, so we're really excited. Um, it's going to be on December 1st and uh, you can come out. It's like potluck style. It's going to be some games. It's really, really fun. And I'll pop the information for that in the chat as well. All right. So I see no one else in the waiting room. So we'll go ahead and get started without further ado. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce Mitch Walters, um, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Florida at the Museum of Natural History. He's going to talk to us today about uh, birds of southeastern Arizona. And I will get out of the way and let him get started. Take it away, Mitch. Okay. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, and thank you, everybody, um, for attending. Uh, it's always an honor and privilege to be giving um, a talk here. Uh, I think this is now my third one. I've given a talk uh, about my research and then a photog bird photography basics talk. And now... We're in the realm of pure bird watching, okay? And specifically, we're going to talk about uh, an amazing trip I um, I had at one of the, um, arguably one of the best bird watching destinations in the United States, which is uh, Southeast Arizona. So um, if everyone could just, just type in yes or no, if you've ever uh, been to Southeast Arizona and done the, uh, and done the, uh, the Southeast Arizona birding experience. I just want to see some yeses, some nos in the chat. Uh, let me see. We have some no's. Anybody else? Just don't be shy. I want to. I'm curious if there's anyone who's who's uh who's gone yet. Because if not, we'll have okay, good. Emily, there we go. Yeah, not surprised. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so um, I'm sure there's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Southeast Arizona, right? And uh, and its lore. But um, hopefully everybody uh, learns a little something about uh, ah, about this amazing place, um, a place that I think it's very easy to design a trip on your own and have great success. OK, so what am I going to be really sort of talking about? So what makes Southeast Arizona special? Why is it like one of the top places to go in the U.S.? Right. There's a lot of cool places we can go, um, but Southeast Arizona always seems to be on the top. Right. And then obviously the the big part is you know going to be about what birds you can see and where. And then because I study ecology um, here at UF, uh, I'm going to kind of insert a little bit about um, some of the uh, ecology, uh, ecological and sort of um, uh, 
uh, sort of uh, habitat preferences of these species, because I think that that's going to be really um, important in in increasing the success of seeing some of your target some of your target birds. Okay, so I didn't do this trip alone. I went to visit um, a very dear friend of mine and former lab mate, um, Dr. Harrison Jones, uh, who is now a Southwest avian ecologist at the uh, this NGO called the Institute for Bird Populations. He's based in Flagstaff. So what better person to go to Southeast Arizona than a Southwest avian ecologist? We've published papers together, gone on many birding adventures together. So I, there really isn't a better person I'd want to, I'd want to, I'd want to go on a trip like this with. So a lot of the ecological things I'm going to talk about and stuff, uh, you know, kind of came from him because he's, he's, he's the expert. Right. So what exactly makes um, Southeast Arizona special, right? So um it has something called the Sky Islands, which are an isolated group of mountain ranges like this, like little kind of um, little little islands that uh, are kind of the bridge between two um, very uh, different mountain ranges climatically. You've got the Rocky Mountains and the sort of Colorado Plateau of the north, which is very temperate. And then you have the Sierra Madre, um, uh, specifically the Occidentalis of Mexico, which are very uh, subtropical. And it's that... Um, it's these Sierra Madres that pretty much trickle into, as you can see, only this part of the United States and nowhere else. And that's what attracts a lot of birders because it, it's bringing a lot of species from Mexico that, you know, for birders that want to get those, that elegant trogan or that Montezuma quail on their, on their, you know, U.S. list, there isn't really any other place to go in the United States except for Southeast Arizona. Plus you also got lots of temperate birds too. So it's, um, which leads to a lot of really good um diversity right so um and so as a result of that right you get um uh you have four basic uh habitat types that um sort of uh, form so at the driest end you have sonoran desert uh so each of these habitats have completely different avifauna so you have sonoran desert and then you at the base of these um Sky Islands, you have mesquite grassland. It's just grass and mesquite bushes. Um, and then as you kind of get into the forest proper, you get into uh, oak, pine, riparian woodland. And then as you climb higher in elevation, you get into the mixed conifer forest, right? And then um, it's what's also great about Southeast Arizona is that it's got very established hotspots. People have been going there for a long time. So it's really easy to figure out where to go there are a lot of bed and breakfasts that are just designed for the birder so they have like theaters and stuff and some of these bed and breakfasts are like the only place that people are seeing certain species like a lot of the hummingbirds for instance you know like this person's this person's bed and breakfast has the white-eared hummingbird so everybody goes to that and sits on these chairs and and watches you know waits for the hummingbird so it's kind of so it's very easy birding in a lot of in a lot of cases it's also very compact, right? I just, uh, I could have done a, a talk on a trip I went to years ago um, in Alaska, which was unbelievable, but so different from Arizona and Southeast Arizona in particular, because uh, Alaska is massive, huge, it takes hours and hours to get anywhere, right? It's like, oh, oh, they found a Northern Hawk Owl. Let me go to this place. Well, that's like six hours, right? Whereas here, you know, you can, we're talking an hour and a half max, you know, to places. So you're spending a lot more time birding than you are like commuting, which is a huge plus. Okay. So this is the uh, sort of lay of the land. Okay. We were there in, um, in sort of early July. Is that the, is that the ideal time to go? It's certainly uh, a fine time to go uh, to see. We saw pretty much, we saw like everything you can pretty much see there. Uh, if you want to see a lot more of the nocturnal birds and really get birds at the peak of their singing, probably May um, is probably a little bit better uh, because things are just starting to breed. But July is still, um, is still very, very good. We saw pretty much everything, uh, but that's just FYI. So we had, there's three good spots to go to in, um, uh, in the Tucson area that I'll talk about. And then we get into the Sky Islands areas down in the Southern part there. So the Santa Rita mountains, then Patagonia Lake State Park, which is a totally different ecosystem. And then into another Sky Island system, the uh, Huachuca mountains. That's how you pronounce that with various different canyons and access points and stuff like that. So day one, morning one, 
Yes, you are reading the name correctly. It's the very same as our own eBird hotspot, Sweetwater Wetlands Park. Just so I guess if there's a place, right? If there's a bird watching spot called Sweetwater Wetlands, just go to it because apparently it's 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 bird awesomeness. So it kind and this place kind of looks like Sweetwater Wetlands, right? So uh you can see why it's great, because it's like this green space in amongst the you know, urban, dry landscape that is, you know, Tucson, right? This is going to be a common theme for a lot of these lowland hotspots. So this is a great dip your toes in the birds of the Southwest. So if you've never been to the Southwest and haven't seen, you know, uh, Gamble's quail and, you know, stuff like that, like this is a great introductory. But if you want to get straight into the Sky Islands, like by all means, go ahead. But I think this is a nice introduction. So for instance, right off the bat, right out the gate, right? Wonderful looks at this charismatic bird, right? Doesn't get much more charismatic than this. We've had quite a few of these guys showing up, interestingly enough, in in the county, but they are they are very very common in these kind of lowland, sort of riparian areas in um in southeast Arizona, which of course is vermilion flycatcher. Uh, we came across a nice group of a nice family group of Cooper's hawk, and then this guy on the right, uh, not a bird that is easy to see in the United States if you go to South. America, you're practically swatting them out of the way. They're so common. But this is a tropical kingbird. And this was the only place we actually saw a tropical kingbird. Uh, so you can tell it's important to know that because you have castings and western kingbird also, right? We don't really have to worry much about kingbirds uh, in the in Florida, but there are three very similar looking guys. Um, this guy has got a lot more bolder, yellow, gray and then like kind of the green mantle so very bold coloration and then a long bill relative to the body length compared to cassins and uh um and western and then another one of my favorite little guys um this is a black tailed gnat catcher uh obviously males with a black cap very easy to tell between that and say you know your blue gray gnat catcher which is also can also be found there but if you don't come across the male, you want to look for the undertail coverts, which are going to be black for black-tailed and then white for a blue-gray. So other species that you'll see, guaranteed to see these guys elsewhere. So again, this isn't, I mean, tropical kingbird, actually, that was the only place we saw that bird. But um, for the most part, everything else you will see. Okay, so great introductory part. And let's not forget, I know this is a, uh, this is a bird group, but I mean, I think we all appreciate other uh other taxa in the desert provides a lot of that. So here's a desert spiny lizard there, and then a lot of great looks at jackrabbits, which are just awesome, right? So a lot of other cool stuff to look for in the desert. Um, also, uh, the there's also National Park, Suaro National Park, which, by the way, is also they 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 call it they pronounce it Suaro without the G in Tucson. I found out you could spend a whole day here. Um, it's about an hour from, uh, uh, or maybe like 45 minutes from Sweetwater and, uh, actually no, it's, it's much less than that. Uh, I think about 25 minutes or so. And, uh, the Red Hills Visitor Center is a great place to start. A lot of overlook trails to kind of, you know, park your car and walk out and you're basically going to be walking into this habitat. No trees. The trees are the cactus, shrubs, and dirt, right? And it's pretty much impossible not to see... This guy, uh, black-throated sparrow, they are everywhere. Um, they're like our savanna sparrows and house sparrows, you know, here. You're definitely going to see them. Like I said, gambles quail, uh, curve-billed thrasher, um, and then a very uh, iconic, charismatic bird of the desert southwest, the uh, cactus wrens. You'll be hearing the the sound. The uh, kind of sounds like a kind of through the, through the desert, which is really cool. Um, here's one doing its best rock wren impression. Uh, there are also there's also another cardinalid to be aware of. You we, you can see northern cardinal at some of the riparian areas, but much more common in the deserty parts, the Sonoran parts, or the pearloxia, and that's a free beer to anyone who can spell that one properly. Um, that's that's I'd be I'd be very impressed. Uh, and then yeah, roadrunners. Who doesn't like roadrunners? Um, and that's what they do. They run across the road like they just you just driving commuting places, and then oh, whoop, there it goes right. Meet me. So yeah, um, can never get tired of that. So uh, that's very nice. So other species to see in the classic uh, desert Southwest spots, right? Right here, Gila woodpecker is like their red-bellied woodpecker. Um, I put Harris's hawk in asterisk because we did not see that one. 
And it turns out we weren't really quite in the right spot. That bird has become much more urbanized over the years. So in, uh, in there are a lot of like kind of urban parks with more water sources um, that are deserty that apparently are much more uh, likely for Harris's hawk rather than the big national park. So that's just such a cool bird. That's the only cooperative breeding hawk species. I think that's really out there, especially in the United States. Uh, group hunting bird, just, yeah, uh, they're really cool. So by about 1030, it was 106 degrees, which meant it was time to leave the lowlands and go somewhere else, like hop, hop up in the mountains. So about an hour and 15 or so from uh, like Saguaro, just completely different ecosystem and weather and everything. We went up into Mount Lemon, okay, uh, which kind of looks like this. This is mixed conifer forest, okay? So just FYI, there are a lot of different spots that is a um, kind of a uh, uh, sort of skiing resort area in the winter. But a great place to go birding in the in sort of the summer and a lot of hot spots. We spent pretty much all of our time at the butterfly trailhead in this Marshall Gulch picnic area. We didn't go, we didn't hike between, we just parked here, birded, drove all the way around, and then went to Marshall Gulch. And I think uh you could probably go, there's probably evidence for other places, but in my opinion, these are the two, the two spots to go to. So right off the bat. Out the parking lot at the uh, Butterfly Trailhead, our first sort of Southeast Arizona specialty, which is the beautiful yellow-eyed Junko, right? Kind of looks like uh, there are many different color morphs of the dark-eyed Junko. Um, and uh, this this looks just like one of the morphs, the brown-backed, or can't remember what it was off the top of my head, but it just said the dark-eyed has a yellow eye. So yeah, very open understory, uh, like shrubbery, grass, grass kind of flat um this is a place like uh that's really good for that so parking lots right parking lots are flat so excellent kind of area for um for that bird a few other guys in the in the area white breasted nuthatch uh the the vireo of the southwest like conifer forest is the plumbius vireo which are always singing uh one of the more common empidinax flycatchers right you're going to be talking someone's going to be talking about empids uh next uh next talk this is the uh, Cordieran flycatcher, um, the beautiful uh, black-headed grosbeak. Uh, the top two guys are not restrictive to uh, mixed conifer forest. You can also find them in um, kind of uh, riparian zones. But of course, what are you really trying to see when you go up into these mixed conifer forests of Southeast Arizona? You want to see the specialty warblers, okay? There are three main ones, okay? First guy is our olive warbler, which is actually not a warbler. It's not in the same family as all of our wood warblers. It's in its own family. So it's just, I love those guys. That means it's this, it's a it's a weirdo. It's like the yellow-breasted chat. Like, what are you? Are you a warbler? Are you a, like, are you a dog? Like, we don't know, right? We're all, we're, everyone's confused. So, uh, so this is a, I used to kind of think that all of warbler and the other warblers I'm going to talk about are kind of all synonymous when it comes to habitat preference, but there is microhabitat differences up in this uh, mixed conifer. So this guy is our highest elevation preference bird. So really, at least in the Huachuca Mountains, um, above 2,600 meters, right? So that's pretty high up there. Okay, so it does. So you need to kind of really climb up to see it. They do like ponderosa pine. So yeah, so ponderosa pine, white pine. Um, uh white spruce is also arizona pine there's, there's several other species that are that are up there but this guy really likes ponderosa pine as does our second guy which is um kind of looks like yellow throated warbler but this is grace's warbler okay and this is also a um uh ponderosa pine kind of preference bird it's where he likes to nest and you can see that although it does get into the really high elevation range it's a lot more flexible Right, it can get into 1800 and in between. And then my favorite of the trio, it's got to be the red-faced warbler. Love this guy, okay? Um, and this guy really likes areas that slope. So unlike the yellow-eyed junco, which likes to kind of flat, this guy always kind of likes to be in areas that are sloping down into like drainages, riverbeds, so seepages. And this is something that Harry told me, like, Every time we saw this bird or heard this bird, it was in that exact type location, right? So that's that's the kind of stuff that can be really key. So the Marshall Gulch picnic area goes along a riverbed 
And we didn't see any of these guys at the first spot, but at, at Marshall Gulch, we were seeing several of them. So microhabitat ecology, it really does help. A um, few other birds, okay, some cool ones like a paddock tanager, Rivali's hummingbird. These are both kind of Southeast Arizona specialties. Zone-tailed hawk, uh, you can see them in more of the lowland kind of areas as well. Just FYI, okay, if you're in Southeast Arizona, look at every turkey vulture. I know that's not really in our, you know, in all of our best interests sometimes as birders, like a uh, turkey vulture. But hey, could be this guy. And it's not a coincidence, all right? This is a form of mimicry because if you're a, you know, little rat or, you know, lizard or something and you see, a, and you see, you know, a turkey vulture flying over, you're like, eh, I'm good. I'm safe. And then whoop, maybe not, right? So zone tail talk. Look, look at every turkey vulture because you never know. Um, all right. So that's day one. We haven't entered the Sky Islands yet. So awesome, awesome start to the trip. So one hour and a half, we went out into our first, our second Airbnb called Green Valley. Uh, sounds like something from like a Disney movie. Um, it's just a bunch of like, like, uh, kind of, um, just different suburban areas, but it, it is 20 minutes away from our first Sky Islands which is part of the uh, Santa Rita mountain range. And this is Madeira Canyon. There's Harry right there doing his best sort of John Muir impression, um, looking out amongst the land. And I like this picture because it shows you the different habitat types. So we're in the mesquite grassland. You can see that it's going to get real green. So this is sort of the pine, sort of uh, the, the lowland areas, the mixed um, sort of uh, oak riparian woodland. And then as you climb up and up, you get into the mixed conifer. So yeah, a really beautiful kind of place. It's hard not to take photos on the way in. Um, and so what are the spots to go to in Madeira Canyon? Madeira Canyon is a go-to. It is a must-go if you're going to go into Arizona. Um, so MC are the Madeira Canyon spots. There are various trails. The Santa Rita Lodge is sort of your first bed and breakfast type place catered to birders um, with like feeders and stuff. But before we get in there, and by the way, everything on the left side here, we did in the first full day. And then the next morning, we went out to Box Canyon. And, I'll, and we'll talk about why that is. But first, before we went in, we went into these two washes. So why was that? The Florida and McCleary Wash. So this is take this is a photo taken from uh, Google Maps. Um, and yeah, it is pure uh, um, mesquite grassland. I mean, look at it. It's grass and mesquite. And you don't think there's much there, but there's stuff there. And the first thing that we heard and saw was one big target guy, which is the uh, uh, which is um, varied bunting, very beautiful. Kind of sounds like a combination between indigo and uh, sort of um, blue grosbeak. So very war, very like warblery, and lots of little notes kind of crammed in together. Very uh, pure tone, whistly type stuff. But yeah, that habitat. So if you go into eBird and you look at Madeira Canyon, it'll say that this bird's there. But if you go into the uh, oak riparian woodland, you're not going to see this guy. If you go up in elevation, right, into the conifer forest, like I showed you before, you're not going to see this guy. This is a um, dry mesquite grassland bird. Um, so just, you know, that's, and other birds in that area, who doesn't like a good sparrow, right? Um, so unfortunately, I couldn't get the audio to work here um, because that's really how you tell these things apart. But uh, just looking at it, you can kind of tell there's some differences. So the guy on top there is Rufus Wing Sparrow. Guy on the bottom is called Bottery Sparrow. They're both present in, at this wash, and they're both very restricted range in the United States. So the guy on the top, they're both in the same genus, but the guy on the top kind of looks like, you know, our chipping sparrow, field sparrow type. Kind of has a cute little face and a round head, short little bill, right? Whereas the Bottery has a much flatter head with a longer bill. They both have uh, similar type calls, but um, but uh, yeah, they they kind of both sound like a like a um, kind of like a like a pin, like a ping pong ball dropping on a table, like a d d d d d d kind of thing. Um, uh, so the the um Rufus wing is is very just quick, just d d d d d d d d d d. It'll do that versus our botteries, which just likes to, he's very dramatic. He likes to draw it out. So he'll kind of go deep, 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 de
you definitely have to study up on these guys uh, to know them, but they they will be singing at that wash. Guarantee it. Um, other things you're going to have to keep track of, okay, are our, um, uh, our things like, you know, we only have, uh, in terms of big fly catchers, right, we only got our great crested out here. And so uh, um, we don't really have to worry about um, similar genus uh, of this type of uh, this type of guy. But you definitely have to um, in Southeast Arizona. Uh, there are basically three main guys, right? So you have ash throated, which is the one I showed you before. Okay, we occasionally get those in in the county. Brown crested, and then the and then the restricted range guys, dusky capped. They all look kind of similar. Um, ash throated is definitely your dullest and is found in more of the probably more of the drier regions on average. You can see the the habitat descriptions. Dusky capped is really a sky island riparian oak woodland bird, um, and it's the smallest of the bunch. And then brown crested is sort of uh, um, gray crested in size, and kind of kind of everywhere. But none of these guys really get into the high mixed conifer forest. These are all kind of lowland guys. So this is a bird that Harry and I. These are birds that Harry and I were constantly just. Um, uh, was that was that ash throated or was it brown crested? You know, so that one's going to be constantly. You're gonna be working through those ones all the time, which is fun. Yeah. Okay. So once you get out of the wash and you get into Madeira proper, right? You get into the picnic areas, you can see the habitat's totally changing, right? So now we're in like oak riparian woodland. Okay. These are the various uh hot spots. Okay. The D, uh, where Madeira Canyon is, that's where the lodge I talked about is at. There's several trailheads. Um, but honestly, the best place was this. You can see there's this little creek that runs sort of parallel to the road here. And you see there's a little uh, hiking symbol. There is a trail there. And that was that was the best. That was the best birding. OK, this is what it looks like on Google Maps. So um, uh, first thing you can kind of see in the middle are kind of a couple of dead Arizona sycamores, which are very, very popular for some of the species down there. Uh, there are several different oak species, evergreen oak um, as well. And then kind of the main pine species down there is the aptly named alligator juniper. Kind of looks like alligator skin. I love this tree. And th so the species that are really going to be found in this area, okay, it's kind of like a it, like walking through it felt like a southeast Arizona aviary because every single bird we saw was like essentially a, a specialist of the of this region of the United States, right? I mean, like in terms of if you want to see it in the U.S., right? So the most common woodpecker, okay, formerly known as the Strickland's woodpecker is the Arizona woodpecker, all right? There are acorn woodpeckers there, but this is the guy. He's everywhere, okay? The the guy on the left is that dusky capped flycatcher. You'll hear their kind of morning little whistles kind of sound like a... all the time, right? You'll hear them all over the place. And of course, the sound of the psh, 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 all the time, right? The only real uh, parrot species in there is the probably the most flamboyant of our uh, tip mice, which is the bridled tip mouse. Okay. And of course, as you're walking along and you run into a, a, a tip mouse group, right? There's probably other species falling around. And uh, that is very true. You're going to come into uh, species that you'll see with bridled tip mice here. And bridled tip mice are in this habitat. They're not going to be up higher. Um, you'll get. Black throated gray warbler, you get Hutton's vireo, you'll have the dusky cap flycatcher. Um, you know, some of the woodpeckers might be hanging on, but then you get this guy, the other warbler, right? The painted red starts. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Um, so not really doesn't overlap much with the other warblers. This is kind of in the pine and in the oak riparian woodland area. So a little lower down, but beautiful bird. They're fanning their tails out and kind of flashing them along the uh, trunks of the tree and stuff, but you can't miss them. And so you want to follow those, you want to find those flocks because um, you'll definitely see them. Uh, this was definitely the best place for our nocturnal guys. So Harry and I went back at like dusk and within five minutes, we got elf owl, adorable guy pictured there, whiskered screech owl, um, as well as Mexican whippoorwill. Um, we didn't really see any of those birds. But if you want to see them, I'd already seen these guys before, um, but Harry and Harry was fine with just hearing them. But if you want to see them, they're going to be a lot more responsive to playback and stuff earlier in the breeding season. So that's where coming back in May can be beneficial. These guys were a little bit more secretive, but they were still calling. OK, um, if you're in an area with lots of oaks, it's pretty much you're going to see a J and it's 
literally impossible not to see Mexican Jay. They are loud. They're big. They're in big flocks. They're blue. And they're just like, they're there. Okay. So yeah, you're going to walk in there and you will see Mexican Jays doing that. Their, their mouth is always open. They're always calling. And of course, you got to go there to see one of the big ones. One of the sought afters. They're all sought afters, of course, but elegant Trogan. Wah, 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 wah. You'll be hearing those guys again um, in this type of habitat. Okay. So the oak riparian woodlands, this is where you see them. They love sycamores. So you want to really find places with lots of sycamores. That's where they like to nest. And we actually found a nesting pair and it was awesome. That's how I was able to get such a nice photograph of this guy. And the great thing about trogans is they just sit there. It's wonderful, right? Unlike a lot of the warblers and stuff that are moving around, they just sit and park themselves and they can sing for 10 minutes and you just get these great looks. So um, a real treat to see that bird. Okay, so that's Madeira Canyon, right? Pretty awesome. So the next morning we decided to go to a new place. I had been to Southeast Arizona before and had been to Madeira Canyon, but this new one was, this next spot was completely new to me called Box Canyon. And as you can tell right away, it looks very different from Madeira Canyon. It's very dry. Kind of is a bit more of that mesquite grassland type vibe. But what makes Madeira Canyon super cool is that on the right side of the road there, as you come in, uh, and um, is a dry riverbed. So lots of cottonwoods and just greenery, which attracts a lot of things like, say, northern beardless terenulet, which is just a little little M, little, little uh, flycatcher. Um, they are very common there. Like this habitat is a perfect description of this bird. They like it a little bit drier. You won't really see them in the Madeira Canyon area. Lots of these agave uh, plants, sprouting flowers, which attract orioles, included hooded oriole pictured there, as well as Scott's oriole, which is a big sought after bird. Um, Canyon towhee, a lot of cassins, kingbird. Um, no, uh, a ladderback woodpecker was also seen quite a bit there. And a lot of the birds we had seen before. So vermilion flycatcher, once again, uh, yeah, um, Bell's vireo and Gamble's quail and stuff like that. And also um, another really, really cool bird, which is the five stripe sparrow. Okay. This is a bird that used to only be found in one place called California Gulch. And it was a real pain in the butt to get to like four wheel drive monstrosity to get out there and see this guy. They've clearly expanded their range since I was 15 years old when I went there last. And now you can see them in much more accessible places. And yeah, this was one of those eBird hotspots, go to the spot, park your car, look, there they are, right? Sometimes birding is really easy. Um, and so, yeah, there they were. And uh, wonderful, wonderful bird. Um, right, so then... Um, so then we decided to take, okay, so we did have one long drive, two hours, all the way to our next spot in Sonoida, which is near Patagonia. So you might be wondering, why the heck didn't you just drive the 30 minutes in the other direction? The reason why, it's not because we're crazy, it's because there's a really good hot spot in a place called Tubac. Okay, it looks like this, right? I told you from before, those green spaces in the dry landscape is a big thing in the lowlands, and that's what's in Tubac. In particular, we went to this spot with where there's a lot more species richness, and it's called the Juan Batista de Anza Trail. Yep, it is a green oasis in this dry landscape, which is great for birds, right? So it's this river that attracts a lot of cool stuff, okay? The most common bird that we saw at this trail would be one that I think a lot of people would want to see here, right? It's a pretty good one to be common. <whistles> Yeah, so yellow-breasted chat. We had like 25, 30 of these guys on the hike. So pretty cool. So this is definitely a lowland riparian bird for sure. Okay, out in the more open areas, okay, we get into the uh, beautiful phanopepla, our only silky flycatcher, right? Beautiful red eye, crest, black body for male, gray for female, with big flashing white wing patches when they fly. And they're a flycatcher, so in the more open areas, closed forest, you're not going to get them, but... Out in the open, out where the road was, these guys were everywhere. Another really cool bird that's a Southeast Arizona specialty is the gray hawk. All right, if you look up what the gray hawk likes, it likes riparian areas with cottonwoods. And that's the Juan Batista de Anza Trail. So we saw like five of these birds. Like that's pretty much the hawk in this area. So great, great habitat for this bird. 
But what we also went there for was a big target bird. And this is this was our first what I call mega rarity. So we have three categories of birds in, in Southeast Arizona, in my opinion. We have the common Southwest birds, you have the Southeast Arizona birds, and you have the mega rarities. The ones that kind of show up, not every year, kind of here and there. And our first mega rarity was our rose throated Picard, which is pretty cool. So this is a bird that's now become a, a bit more reliable. They seem to be breeding, or at least a pair seems to be breeding. And so this is not far away from the Mexican border. So uh, yeah, not surprisingly, this is a this is a hot this this Batista Trail being a water source attracts a lot of weirdos, including this rose throated Picard, which I was actually somehow able to get its rose throat because the nest was way the heck up in these tall cottonwoods. In case you don't know what a Picard is, if you've been to South America, they're in the same family as the Tatiras. So they're in the Tatiridae family. Yeah, they look nothing like that. Uh, bird also the Chifornises, which also look nothing like either of these two birds. So the Tatiras are kind of a weird melting pot family group. Okay, so then we went um, into in through Patagonia to our horse ranch in Sonoida, and uh, we got the one when it came across this wonderful sign of uh, Montezuma quail. Uh, hopefully, uh, um, good luck to come. Okay, this was the morning of at the horse ranch, right? There's a nice little doggo there. So what was cool about this, you can see the background, it's very grassy. Probably the most pure grassland area that we came across, which was great. As I got my first lifer of the trip, which was Chihuahuan Meadowlark. Yay! Okay, so it's not an elegant trogan. It's not elegant in that in that way. And it's basically just been split from, from uh, Eastern Meadowlark. There are some differences between them now. Uh, the the spotting on the breasts uh, isn't doesn't go all the way to the front of the breast. It's pretty much just on the sides. It's much paler um, than the uh, metal larks we're used to seeing. The white retroces aren't as prevalent in this bird, and they do sound a little different. So hey, I'll take it though. So um, so that was that was nice. Okay, so once we get out of Sonoida, which is kind of further north, we get into the Patagonia area. So now totally not, this is very, this habitat is very similar to the De Anza Trail. So lowland riparian, very dry. Okay. So there's the, uh, there's um, Patagonia Lake State Park. Okay. There's a few other places that we went to in the evening um, uh, of, upon our arrival. So, uh, well, so first of all, the Snowda Creek Preserve is essentially the De Anza Trail part two. It's like literally the exact same kind of habitat. And we basically got the same birds. So if you missed out on some stuff there and you want to kind of go back and check out that habitat and maybe get more looks at vermilion flycatcher or chats and things like that's a good place to go but there's a newly established place called the patent center for hummingbirds okay so one of the great things about southeast arizona it is a hummingbird mecca we pretty much only have one species uh out here right a ruby throated an occasional rufus or something or or actually we did have some one rare boy come in but uh Arizona is the is the hot spot for hummingbirds. And so I hadn't really showed many pictures of it because I wanted to wait till I went to the patent center for hummingbirds, right? So uh, just pay attention to that picture, right? Of a violet crowned hummingbird there. I swear I didn't take this picture, but I basically was able to get that exact <laughs> photo. Eh? Right there. It's like, do you want this photo? We'll come to the patent center. And I'm like, cool, I did it. Um, yeah, so uh, is it birding cheating to go to these places? I don't know. As a photographer, I'm like, I don't care. It's awesome. I try to make I try to make it a point to try to remove the feeder, the feeders from the photo to make it look a little more natural. But yeah, I mean, this bird was like 10 feet from a feeder. And what's great about hummingbirds is they love to go to the same perches over and over again. So you can just if you sit at a, an, an, at a feeder and just wait, you'll realize where the violet crown likes to go, where the Rivalis likes to come. And then you kind of just like can orient yourself and then eventually just kind of get the right settings and stuff. So, and you just get a million opportunities, right? So it's great for photography, great for good looks at stuff. And these, and these hummingbirds, they really are hard to see outside of like out in like, you know, outside of a, of a B and B or, or a place like this. So this is really the, the kind of places to see them. So Violet crowned kind of a drabby looking, uh, Rivales hummingbird, but, uh, magnificent, but you'll definitely see them and hear them because the frequency of their wing beats are a lot lower than everybody else. They're just big when they come in. So they're, uh, um, they're quite large. All right. And then this guy is by far the most common, which is the broad build. We had, we had one in the County, right. At a feeder. 
right? Well, these guys, like, forget it. Like, you will see them. They are all over the place. So, yeah. Plus, this place also was great for lots of other cool things. More chats and, you know, buntings and things. Okay, then the next morning, we went out to uh, Patagonia Lake State Park. Okay, there it is. Um, To go back, all right? Pretty obvious. Where's the best place to go? Well, go to the birding trail. Okay, so you have to kind of, you come in from this road down here, and then you go all the way due east, park your car, okay? And then the trailhead kind of looks uh, like this from the right there, okay? So the on the right, the right picture is what it looks like on the trailhead, okay? And as you can see, it's a mesquite grassland. So you will see those birds again, your Bell's Vireo, your uh, Verdon, which is another one that I haven't really mentioned yet, uh, Pearloxia, uh, uh, varied bunting, ash-throated flycatcher. But then, as you start to wander in, you start to get into something a little more like what you see on the left, a lot more green, because it follows this creek, this Sonoida Creek. And that's where you start to see some different things. All right, like this guy, Inca dove, okay? It looks kind of like common ground dove. It's a small ground dove. It's a lot more scaly, and it's got a long, pointy, kind of dagger-like tail versus the little flat tail that a common ground dove does, which is important, because common ground doves are also everywhere. All right, another kingbird on the left. That's thick-billed kingbird. Okay, that's a pretty rare one. Um, very dull, uh, you know, barely a hint of yellow there on the bottom, white, and then this dark brown, um, and a kind of very thick bill, right? Aptly named. Okay, the guy on the right there, uh, we saw them before, but that's Ebert's toey. Um, uh, our, our toey here is very, very colorful, but, um, we get, uh, some drabber ones. So I'm from California. So California toey basically looks like Abert's toy minus the black kind of dark brown face. And we also got to see another bird, a uh, target bird, a mega rarity number two, which was, um, Rufus capped warbler. Okay. This is another bird that if you go into like parts of Mexico, they are just, you're practically stepping on them. They're very, very common. A very sought after bird. Now, I will prep. I will confess and say I did not take this photo on my trip. On this trip, this was a photo of a Rufus cap I took in in Texas. That was my lifer encounter, which was quite cool. This bird was a lot more uh, obliging for photographs than the other guy. The bird on this trip was a was just it show itself for two seconds, and then was gone. So, uh, and and these guys are very secretive, uh, like kind of uh, very shrubby thick vegetation type birds. So they're very tricky. You hear them, but very hard to see. So I didn't really get a photo of this bird. So I just showed you um, this guy, but yeah. So always be on the lookout for um, for rarities because that might change your trip, right? If you find like all of a sudden like an Aztec thrush, which is a really beautiful charismatic thrush, like shows up in Madeira Canyon. Like you can bet I'm changing my trip to see Aztec thrush, right? So that's the kind of thing you want to always be on the lookout for. Okay. So then we took uh, an hour, 16 minutes. Again, that's that's nothing. That's like going to what? Like, um, that's not even going to Orlando. Like, that's just a little bit past Ocala, right? And uh, we went all the way into um, our final spot, which was the beautiful, um, Chiric uh, sorry, the Huachuca Mountains. This was the view from our Airbnb. So a nice classic uh, mesquite grassland up into this mountain range here. So this is made up of Carr, Miller, and uh, Ramsey Canyons. Okay, so uh, these are the various hot spots that we went to in yellow once again. So our Airbnb was in Nixford, okay, or Nixville, sorry. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. It was just north of Nixville along Ramsey Road. So we were only 10 minutes away from Ramsey Canyon, but there are all these other canyons that you can come into. So Miller Canyon, Carr Canyon, Ramsey Canyon, then this Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary, very similar setup to uh, the patent center for hummingbirds, lots of chairs and feeders and stuff. So that evening we went to a place I had never, oh, oh, right, never mind. Before I get there, this is our Airbnb, quite nice. But we got to see a bird I really wanted to see. I saw it last time when I was in Arizona. It was a decent look, a lot of heat wave action, but I didn't get a photograph. We hadn't seen this bird, but I got to see it. It is the beautiful scaled quail, another wonderful quail to go after. Look at that. Look at that chain mail type uh, pattern, which is much more prevalent, prevalent on the male than the female. Right? This guy looks like he's going into war for like the medieval times, right? He looks like he's you know, about to joust. He's got that kind of look to him. Uh, females and males will both have that crest. Okay. But yeah, 
I mean, wake up one morning and Harry's like, Mitch, there's a scale quail right outside the road. So I, I went into, into Navy SEALs like stealth mode with my camera and tried to get some good shots. And fortunately I did because they were a little timid and I don't like to pester birds that they start to feel timid. Okay. So, uh, so I was glad that happened anyway. So then we went up into car Canyon, a good note about car Canyon. It's easy to remember. You need four wheel drive. If you're going to go up to car Canyon, cause it is a, it is a switch back bumpy road madness to get up there um so fortunately harry had a decent car i did not know that about it because i had never been so car canyon you have a good car there are even signs that say hey be aware need four-wheel drive beyond this point and uh it's a it's a good spot you're gonna see a lot of the same birds at ramsey and in, in uh in miller canyon but you know i wanted to check it out um we went into the old sawmill spring trailhead and reef campground area very pretty area but it was the best place um, to get this guy, which was broad build, uh, um, uh, uh, flycatcher. I'm oh, sorry, a buff, buff breasted flycatcher. Sorry, buff breasted flycatcher, which um is actually not really. You can't. You're not going to see them in Madeira Canyon, and they're not. But we didn't find them particularly common in the other canyons, but they were all over the place in uh in this canyon. Um, I think it's just because it was a little bit flatter and it had a lot of more of a shrubby understory, which they like. Um, so they were very common there. So it's kind of a good spot um, to get this guy. And then, of course, there's a few other things. So brown creepers are all over the place in the mixed conifer. And here's this uh, very inquisitive um, rock squirrel looking at me like, you're from Florida. Why are you do? What are you doing here? He looked very suspicious of me. OK, then our, our I would say one of our best birding uh, days was in Miller Canyon. Um, also, I would say Box Canyon was one of our best birding uh, days. That was like a big surprise. 30 species on the day. Miller Canyon, same thing. Beautiful, beautiful hike up um, into the uh, mixed conifer forest. But it doesn't start off that way. When you when you come in on the lowland, you're starting off in very dry, sort of, kind of oak riparian woodland. And when you park here, you're going to walk through the Beatty's Guest Ranch, which is a very famous uh, ranch for birders. Um, they have bird feeders as well as the hummingbird feeders. And so you have to kind of go through it to get to the Miller Canyon trailhead on the other side. And this was good because we got to see our only look at white-eared hummingbird, which is another kind of mega rarity. Um, usually they are seen at some feeder somewhere. But yeah, this was another one of those. We walked up to the feeder and waited and there it was. Just buzzed right there and beautiful little guy. Okay, once we got into the Miller Canyon um, trailhead, uh, we saw another bird that we didn't really see previously, which was sulfur-bellied flycatcher. They are really common here, um, very streaky. They have a little bit of an orange patch on the upper tail coverts. They're very loud um, and group-oriented, so you will hear them and see them. But I also got to see another new lifer for me, which was the flame-colored tanager. This was a bird I really wanted to see. They've become more common now, as in like more reliable each year. Uh, not a great photograph, not a great, like, uh, like, um, like not the most colorful individuals that we, because that, that, if you look up photos of flame color, like the flame color, that like, that fiery orange can be really, really beautiful. But these guys were um, not quite as, as colorful, but to, just to tell them apart between, see, like, see this male right here, you can see how, how like fiery orange it can get. So we kind of saw something a little bit on the drabber side, but just in case, because you can see Western tanagers and hepatic tanagers there. So the arrows, you see the streak on the back there, the kind of darker facial pattern is kind of similar between flame colored and uh, hepatic, but way more orangey on the flame colored than the hepatic. And then the Western doesn't really have any of that dark facial patterning and a much smaller kind of bill um, compared to flame colored. Okay, there's Harry um, out on the trail. This is this is a perfect example of um, red-faced warbler habitat. So this there's a dry creek bed here, and you can see it slopes down. And I'm pretty sure we heard one and saw one just around there. Uh, this guy, I decided to do a little bit of fishing, and this guy came right on in. I felt like a little Disney princess or something. He was about to land on my finger. Um, he was like right there. So there's our uh, that's black throated gray warbler, really cute little guy um, with a little bit of a little yellow spot on the nose or near the near the bill. Yep. So there we go. That's an example of a that's a Western tanager female. Uh, we are, must have been near a nest. 
Uh, but yeah, so that's that's why it's important to uh, to know the difference between these guys. Other birds that were kind of cool. So we did see buff breasted, not as good of looks. Um, Virginia's warbler is a cool one as well. Uh, I forgot to mention Lucy's warbler is another sort of Southeast Arizona guy, very, very common in the uh, real lowland dry areas, arid areas. But up when you get into the pine, uh, the mixed conifer forest above the tree line where it gets scrubbier, that's where you really get Virginia's warbler. You can sometimes get scrub jay up there. And then greater peewee is a bird that loves uh, this kind of habitat right here. Really tall, dead trees, snags, kind of... Um, getting close to above the tree line that's greater peewee is a bird that's kind of hard to see um and has a specific microclimate um okay we're almost we're almost done one of the more famous canyons is the ramsey canyon uh preserved just a couple of notes most of these places are really um flexible about you just like you park and you can walk in but ramsey canyon is just kind of weird they're very uh look at the look at the hours here okay like you you can't come in like at dawn right like they, there's people there that like are kind of finicky about that it's closed on certain days um the I, I wanted to walk into the uh um uh the, the lodge and it was locked and i had a knock on the door and a guy had a little like thing that opened up and he poked his his like head out and i was like it, it was it was it was a bit of an interesting location but just so fyi they're like they're a little bit more um finicky about coming in and you know just just walking in whenever you want you, you really have to come in at 8 a.m i took this little uh video um i don't know if the sound's going to come in but uh it is quite beautiful and there was like kind of horse tails which i think is a really cool plant and so it's a really nice hike in general even if the birds are being kind of uh uncooperative but yeah this is kind of into the we're kind of entering the moving from the oak riparian into the mixed conifer at this point oh yeah another lifer for me so barrel line hummingbird okay that's another hummingbird uh this guy was was chilling at the uh feeders at at that lodge area okay right near the parking lot so that was really cool it had a nest um kind of a drab brownish green kind of bird but uh I, but hey new for me we also saw our first blue-throated mountain gem there which is another uh, hummingbird, same size as the Rivoli. So another big guy. Just a few other things. Um, just to throw some more pictures in there, we saw Hutton's Vireo there on the right. That's where I got a photo of him. And then this adorable uh, group of young uh, northern flickers that were just care. They're just like <laughs> they're like calling out of their like little little like cavity. Um, so that was cool. Also saw some a couple of really cool reptiles. Okay, so. Look at that guy on the left. That's the Arizona mountain king snake. Like, what a find. Like, we were not, we didn't have our little snake sticks. We weren't lifting rocks and, like, you know, trying to look for this stuff. We were just walking. Harry goes, holy crap, look at that. And then this thing just slithers across the trail. And I was just like, that is, like, amazing. So what a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, snake. And then this guy, I, the name is, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of this uh, spiny lizard. But it is, um... I found out that it, I, I sent it to one of my, a friend of mine who studies reptiles here. And she said that it's a, uh, this was another Southeast Arizona specialty uh, uh, reptile, which is quite cool. So this was another um, spiny tailed lizard. Um, okay. We're rounding out uh, the talk here. The last place, the Ash Canyon bird sanctuary. See open dawn to dusk. Come on, Ramsey Canyon. Like you can do it. So yeah, so a uh, nice little place to sit down, chairs, feeders, right? It's a, I love going to these places in the evening after we've hiked all day. Like just want to sit with my camera and take pictures of stuff, all right? They love burgers, all right? Pretty obvious where to park. All right, this is not a, a, a bird that like, wow, I can't wait to see it. All right, you, we can see white-winged dove in the county, but they it, it is impossible not to see white-winged doves. I just like this photo. Um, we also saw a ton of lesser goldfinches everywhere. Uh, lots of blackbirds, um, bronze cowbird, uh, a few other smattering of things we've seen before. But then our fat, our last new hummingbird was the beautiful Lucifer hummingbird. Tiny little guy, beautiful uh, purple gorget, long decurved bill. This was one of those birds where I was at the wrong feeder at the wrong time all evening. Oh, Mitch, it's here. It's here. Oh, no, it's gone. 
And I just like waited at this like feeder I was coming to like all day and it like it finally came at dusk. You can see the camera is like the, the image is very grainy because it was like really dark. But hey, he showed up. And to save it for last, the number one bird I wanted to see on the trip, we heard about this bird coming to this sanctuary uh, at, in the pond area that was there. And uh, I have a great story about seeing this same species previously, but I didn't get a photograph of it because it was it was like basically at night. But I heard about this bird. We wanted to see it. And Harry was like, Mitch, he was like, he's just beckoning me to come over, like, get over here. So I came over and sure enough. Wow, what a what an ending to the trip. What a this is the Montezuma quail. This is a really, really hard bird to see. Unlike most quails that will fly when they get spooked, this guy will hunker. Um, uh, so, so if you don't see it, you're not going to see it. But if you do see it, you can get great photographs of it. But this guy wasn't spooked by us. He just came right up. So there's the male and there's the female in the back. And then he decided just to, just to hang out. That was like six feet from me. Unbelievable. So, hey. We had another encounter with this with with a male and female with 15 little youngsters on the way down from Car Canyon. I couldn't even tell what it was. I thought they were like mice in, in, in like the dark and like the light of the car. And I was like, holy crap, they're Montezuma quail. It's a whole family of them. And, and Harry, that was our first encounter. And like the male and the female did this broken wing display thing. And they were like freaking out when I got out of the car. So that was really cool. But I couldn't get any photographs of it. Um, uh, but then and then fast forward to like the next day or two and we get an encounter like this. So, Hey, maybe this isn't the most wild encounter, but I'm not complaining. It was awesome. So, uh, yeah, so definitely check the eBird. And and the way I was able to tell this one is that, you know, Montezuma quail is not one that people are going to see regularly at a site. They're really just kind of like a random sighting. But so I noticed that people were seeing it regularly, um, at this place. And that is what gave me the hint to go over and, try to see it and sure enough it worked out okay so in summary 136 species not too shabby 423 miles driven between 13 ebird hotspots that's uh in comparison 600 miles oh no i'm sorry 600 including trips to and from airbnb so i this was just if you it, so 423 from hotspot to hotspot versus 850 between four hotspots in alaska so yeah so you can kind of get the idea of like is it more or less driving, right? It's very little driving compared to the to the um to the birding. And then yeah, just to give you an idea of price of Airbnb, $486 uh, per person, um, not too, too bad. Uh, and so um, you know, compared to a lot of these other places. So if you want to go to Alaska and stuff, it'll be a little more expensive. But um, but yeah, that is that's my that's what I got to say. And uh I hope everybody enjoyed um uh the presentation and uh yeah if you have any questions uh please let me know uh, identification questions trip questions uh you know anything just uh i'd love to hear what you guys have to say thank you so much wow thank you so much mitch that was awesome um lots of really great photos i'll start us off with questions uh but if you do have questions go ahead and type them into the chat or if you know how to raise your hand on here feel free to do that too and we can we can go through in order um my question is is what how long was your trip again and what is the minimum number of days you'd recommend for someone traveling out there to get you know the, you're totally the right anywhere? you're totally right i uh i i don't think i did mention um the the time that was a week of of, uh, of of travel there so uh yeah i mean uh because the areas like the areas are not super big so uh you don't need to um spend more than a full day uh i think um at at a lot of these places um if you want to really just kind of enjoy the landscape and the hiking aspect oh yeah by all means like it's a beautiful area so take more time but in order to get the birds I didn't, I mean, I mean, granted, Harry and I, we've been birding for a long time. And so, uh, and Harry's like, you know, he works essentially in Arizona. So we could get most of the birds in a day. But yeah, I think a week um, was very comfortable. Now, uh, I noticed that someone um, uh, did ask, 
did you go to Cave Creek? So it sounds like someone knows a little bit about Southeast Arizona. It just says Zoom user, so I'm assuming that is not your name. But uh, but yeah, uh, um, if if not, that'd be that be. My name is Mr. User, Mr. Zoom User. Um, but no, I. So Cave Creek is a very famous place in another mountain range, another uh sky island called the uh, Chiricahuas. So no, we did not go. We did not have time to go there. I had been there before. What I will say about Cave Creek and Sycamore Canyon, which is another uh, famous spot, is you are going to get pretty much the same stuff. The only thing that's different is you. It, the Chiricahua is the only place you can get Mexican chickadee, um, which kind of just looks like a like a black cap chickadee, Carolina chickadee. Uh, but it's but it's not. It's different. So uh, if you want to go see that bird, which you totally should, um, Harry and I had seen it before. Um, we'd been to Mexico and stuff before, so we didn't want to bother going all the way over there. But yeah, I mean, it's another, another. if you missed Montezuma Quail, if you missed Trogan, then go to the Chiricahuas and like go ahead and try to see all this stuff again because it's it's worth it. But yeah, um, but yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, I'm glad everybody liked, uh, liked the talk. Uh, I love giving talks like this and, and showing you that, you know, you can get not only not only can you um see these birds you can get good looks at them you know you really can especially at these little sanctuary spots um but yeah definitely go to the cherry cows if you haven't been we just didn't have the time we got another question here pam asked what's the best time to see warblers in breeding plumage ah yeah um so i would say uh like so if you want to go there during migration, you know, go there in, in, in kind of late April. Uh, like that's, that's great. If you want to get a lot of the migratory things. So probably get some Townsend's and hermit warbler, maybe going through. Um, I've never been down there in, in migration, but I mean, we, we were there and all the warblers we saw were like, were like, like textbook, like the red face warbler was like, bam, right there. Right. So, you, I, I would say, like, I, like I said, I think May, um, is good, uh, and then if you want to go late April to to get some of the mi mi uh, migratory stuff, um, all of that stuff's going to be in snazzy, snazzy plumage. If you start to get too late, then you start to come into, uh, if you get too late into the summer, um, they, it, it gets going to get, it's going to, a, it's going to get super hot, which sucks, um, and then it also, I mean, it already was really hot. Also, you want to avoid the monsoon season. I forgot to mention that. So, uh, June is uh generally when things start to happen it was already starting to rain oh no so we were in, in early july so usually uh, i meant like later in july august is when the monsoons start to hit and that's when obviously it gets hard to hard to bird it's very important for that ecosystem to get the rain but it's not it's not great so again may i think would be good for uh avoid the weather avoid the really hot weather the monsoons everything will be snazzy in plumage everything will be singing that's what i would say um, yeah, but uh, yeah, everything we saw in July was, looked, looked great. Sweet. Oh, we have another question, uh, from Tanya. Are many of the trails slash locations friendly for someone who has the ability to hike relatively even paths, uh, ver versus like steep and rocky paths? I think we're talking about trail accessibility here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, also very good question. Uh, uh, yeah. All pretty much all the trails that I showed um are definitely uh they're not crazy in Rocky. The the Miller Canyon one, um, because you have to go from you're climbing an elevation, that one uh yeah, towards the towards the top, it starts to get switchbacky and pretty steep. Uh um, but if so if but I, it's worth it if you can make it up there because you really can see the habitat change. Uh but other than that, the rest of them were totally totally doable uh especially in the lowlands those are all just like flat just easy um and also not hard to not hard to lose the miller canyon one i will also add it was tricky to locate we had to go through the um uh we had to go through the ranch and then there's a gate on the other side and we were able to find the trail there uh so yeah miller canyon was the only one i would say that was kind of um kind of tricky uh but yeah I, I, yeah i'll say that the the mixed conifer for forest ones are going to be probably most likely to have maybe something going on but um but like the ones that i highlighted except for miller canyon they were all very accessible not not super not super bad and I, and trust me i know i know you know i'm not i'm, I'm being honest 
So yeah, they're worth it. Awesome. Any other, I don't think I see any questions, but if you, you feel like I missed something, feel free to speak up. Lots of great compliments on the chat. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I do love my photography and, you know, if you want to do photography, they're like photography, like if anyone's into photography, like that, you always sometimes have to spend like a photography birding, a photography bird watching trip is very different from a birding birding trip. When I, like, if I wasn't with Harry, who's like a, we have to check every, we have to count every house finch that we see, like, which is great because we saw everything. It was wonderful. But there, I mean, like, I'm also the type that can sometimes I'll, I'll I could stay an extra day because I came into an amazing, if I, if I like came across a nest of like, yeah, Trogan, I didn't really get a lot of time to look at it. I would want to spend another day or morning like photographing that bird. So, but in, like I said, in terms of seeing most of this stuff, you don't really need more than a full morning um, or just like a full half day and you'll get most of the stuff. But yeah, a lot of this, a lot of these places are, are just awesome. And yeah, Box Canyon was such a surprise. I was like, I have no idea if it's going to be any good. And it was, it was great. So what, uh, for someone who's never traveled there, what group of birds would you recommend that people need to study up the most on? Yeah. Um, the, um, so, I mean, I get, I get very intimidated thinking that there it could be in one place and see like eight species of hummingbirds, but. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the hummingbirds, because there's so many of them that show up, um, you're going to get the males and the males are pretty, uh, distinctive. Yeah. When you start to get into the female stuff that like we had a female Costas hummingbird show up to one of the feeders and I had to look into my, into my guide, uh, what that looked like. I just, I mean, but, you know, but hummingbirds, because there's enough males that show up, uh, like, you'll you'll be able to see one of each of the species for sure uh i would say the trickiest ones like i said um oh fine i was trying to figure out what the type of one it was but the tyrant flycatchers that's one you're going to want to study so your ash-throated versus brown crested versus um uh dusky capped they look the same they're slight like i said there's slight size differences there's slight boldness in the in the or, or or drabness in the browns and stuff but uh but yeah and the, and like i tried my best to like see if there was there are little ecological differences well you're more likely to see one in one place but honestly like uh, harry and i were always just like like you know like <laughs> was that a brown crested ah, i might have been ash throated where you know because when you're here it's great crested we you know we know what that is and so it makes it uh makes it a lot easier so that one uh, those three are are constantly um kind of buzzing around your head to make sure, uh, at least in in the in the areas that are not the conifer, the mixed conifer. Um, let me see. Besides that, the yeah, and again, the kingbirds, right? Again, in the flycatcher realm, Cassin's western tropical thick build. You're gonna want to know those guys. Um. I all I as someone who studies acoustics, always just knowing the songs of stuff to the best of your ability. Having someone like Harry there was a godsend because I he I mean I, it's taken me a PhD worth of time to learn my Florida birds and be comfortable with them. So uh, so I I was you know Hepatic Tanager, Western Tanager, Black Headed Grosbeak, even American Robin. They all have a very sing songy type cadence to their song, and I. You know, I had I had a hard time with that. So um, if you can if you can get the time, especially with the and of course the sparrows, right, would be another one to study up on. Definitely the songs because um, they're going to be harder to see. So yeah, I would say flycatchers, and then the the sparrows. Those are probably the the ones to you know take a little take a little gander. Excellent. Well, no other uh, questions popped up in the chat. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you again, Mitch, for a great presentation. I hope to see you all next time at our next presentation where we travel to Cuba on December 8th. And please email me if you have any questions about evening programs or Christmas bird counts. Absolutely. Yeah, Cuba is a wonderful place. So definitely check that out. All right. Well, all thank right. you so much. And uh, yeah, you guys all have a good evening and stay dry. I'm pretty sure it's <laughs> still pouring outside. So is indeed enjoy all right thank you guys bye everyone